Buongiorno, benvenuto. Hello and welcome to the very first episode of the very first City Breaks series, City Breaks Florence. City Breaks in general is going to take um, various places that you're likely to visit in a city, if you go there on a city break, and look behind the scenes a little bit and tell you the history and the culture and something about the personalities of the people who are connected with that place. But for today, I'm not really going to start with that. I'm going to start with an introduction to the Florence series and mention some geographical and historical facts to set things in context a little bit and talk briefly about some of the themes that will keep recurring as we go through the remaining 18 episodes, which will be on the places to visit in Florence itself. But just before we do that, one little remark that I found interesting. Um, If you think of Florence, even if you don't know much about it, you probably think of it as a city full, full, full of sublime works of art, and you certainly wouldn't be wrong about that. But I thought it might be interesting to just point out that to the Florentines themselves, their city is also known as the city of Mangia Fagioli, which means the city of the bean eaters. So they're quite up for the sublime end of the scale and the very prosaic at the other end. And I'm hoping that our series will cover both those things and everything in between. Okay then, so to make a start with the few factors, uh, geographical factors, which I think are important to bear in mind. Um, Florence, of course, is a North Italian city. And bearing in mind that its heyday was in medieval times and during the Renaissance, it's important to remember the geography of Italy makes it very cut off. It's a peninsula cut off by the sea on three sides and, of course, across the northern end by the Alps. So that meant particularly pre-modern transport links, that city-states like Florence were very independent. They ruled themselves. They had a very particular flavour of their very own. It's important too to set Florence in Tuscany, so to, to note that of course it's surrounded by beautiful countryside, rolling hills, vineyards. And perhaps the third important factor is the fact that it's built on the river, the River Arno. That becomes hugely important at various points, particularly five times during the last century since uh, 1178, when the river has flooded majorly, causing massive destruction, um, last time being in 1966. So the river is always important to any city that's built on it, of course, but in Florence it does pay, play a particularly crucial role. It's also the river, of course, that cuts the city in half, or more accurately, perhaps into a quarter and three quarters. And if you look at an old-fashioned map of Florence, you'll often see that it's got four coloured quarters, three of which are north of the river. That will be the red quarter, built around the church of Santa Maria Novella, the green quarter, around San Giovanni, and the blue quarter, around Santa Croce. Of course, it's no coincidence that three major churches were seen as the focal points of the various areas of the city, because Florence was a city in which church life and cathedrals played a massive role. What about the fourth quarter? I can hear you wondering. Okay, well, that's south of the river. That was known as the White Quarter, and it was clustered around the church of Santa Spirito. Thinking about the geography of Florence a little further, um, important to mention what used to be a hill town known as Fiesole, which overlooks the city. It's practically part of the city these days. It was Roman in origin. It became a, a rural retreat for wealthy Florentines, particularly during the 19th century. And you may recall, um, if you've read A Room with a View by E.M. Forster, that it was also the goal of excursions. Um, some of the characters there went out to Fiesole and had a, a particularly dramatic uh, afternoon, which you may have read about. And then lastly, the just to say that the city is fairly compact. Um, it's got an inner zone that's largely car-free and which centres around the Piazza del Duomo, or the Cathedral Square, as it's called in English. Um, that cathedral with the brown dome designed by Brunelleschi which is recognised the world over, which is probably the symbol of Florence on the biggest number of postcards ever sent from the city. Uh, There's a second square that's almost as important. That would be the Piazza della Signoria, just a few moments walk away from the cathedral square. 
Piazza della Signoria is actually much bigger um, and you're bound to find yourself crossing it in all directions as you go from one site to another. Turning then to history, I'd like to give an overview without getting too bogged down in the detail. So obviously Florence started a small settlement on the banks of the river and grew and grew. And perhaps the first key date to mention would be 1173, which is the year in which work was started on building a new city wall. So Florence very much at that stage becoming a city, feeling it needed to defend itself from outsiders. So the Florence of the 1200s was very much dominated by one major conflict, which ran for decades between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, two rival factions. The Guelphs were people who, by and large, supported the Pope, thought the church should play a role in running the city. The Ghibellines begged to differ. They were their opposers. They wanted somebody not connected with the church. They thought the emperor was far more important. They wanted the city not to be ruled by the church. Even that early, in the 13th, uh, 12th century and into the 13th century, there was a lot of activity going on in Florence. We can tell that by the number of guilds that they were, which give a good idea of the sort of people who were living and working in Florence. So there were seven major guilds, um, things like the judges and notaries, uh, the bankers, who of course were going to become very, very important, um, and quite a few guilds um, linked to uh, the clothing and cloth manufacturer, so the woolen guild, the silk guild and the furriers. They were all major guilds and there were 14 more minor guilds, which again give a picture of the sort of thing that was going on in the Florence of the time. So there were guilds especially for people like butchers and bakers, for cobblers, for carpenters, for locksmiths. Interestingly, even that early, there was a guild for hoteliers. So the idea of welcoming visitors, which of course leads to the modern day tourism industry, was very important. And other guilds which I've yet to mention include things like the Guild of Cobblers or Tanners or Armour Makers. So all of that tells you quite a lot about the activity that was going on in the city at the time. Another major feature would be the families who became important in the city. So the rival families, often competing against each other, um, who showed their domination in various ways, one of which was by building towers. So people would build a tower onto their house, partly for defence, it was somewhere to take refuge if you were being attacked, and partly to show off what a big tower you could build. And this in fact got so out of hand that in the year 1250, the authorities finally decided it was getting going too far. So they introduced an order which said that all towers must be reduced to a maximum height of 40 metres. And from then onwards, you couldn't build a tower that was any taller. 1300 is the beginning of a new and important phase in Florence because it was from then onwards that some of the major churches began to take shape. So churches like um, Santa Maria Novella and Santa Croce were both built in the 13th century, as indeed were some of the palaces, places like um, the Palazzo Vecchio was started about the, the year 1300 as well. And all of this activity meant a great growth in the number of artisans, craftsmen and artists who came to Florence knowing that there would be people willing to pay them for their trade, for their craft, for their arts. Um, and that became a major feature of the city, which of course is still important today. Three key dates in the early medieval period were the years in which three of the terrible floods devastated the city. That would be 1178, 1269 and 1333. And if that weren't bad enough, in 1348, so only 15 years later, came a particularly virulent episode of the Black Death. Much more about all of those things in episodes to come. And alongside these things, again in the 14th century, began the writings of several authors, I'm thinking of Dante, Boccaccio and Petrarch, all of whom wrote so well that their works became well known throughout the rest of Italy and then eventually into Europe as well, and which these days would be, all three of them would be named as people who laid the foundations for modern Italian literature. In the early 15th century, a key date, the year 1413, is when the Medici family arrived in Florence, and they of course were going to become very important and rule the city over 
several generations, well, for 200 years in total. They were important uh, very much because they were, in many cases, strong rulers who left their mark on what happened in the city, but also because some of them, particularly uh, Cosimo de' Medici and his grandson uh, Lorenzo il Magnifico, Lorenzo the Magnificent, were very enthusiastic patrons of the arts. They took artists and writers and scientists under their wing, paid for them in many cases, living expenses, took them into their houses on some occasions, and generally created the conditions in which these people could do their best work. And so they very much were part of the reason why Florence became a city of the Renaissance. Of course, it wasn't all plain sailing. The Medici were expelled at one point, um, and while they were away was the episode of the mad monk, as he became known, um, Savonarola, who, whose fiery preaching took most Florentines under its spell until eventually they saw through him and he was executed, being burnt um, in the city square. Jumping forward a little bit, in the 1700s, um, Florence was ruled by the Habsburg dynasty, so no longer an independent city-state. Uh, the French invaded in 1799. They had a period of ruling. And in the 19th century, the key date would be 1861, which was the date of the Risorgimento, or the unification of Italy when it became one country. And for the first 20 years of that, in fact, the capital city was Florence. And then moving into the 20th century, uh, there's the rise of fascism. Mussolini came to Florence and brought Hitler with him. World War II... And the date at which I propose to end the history period is 1966, with the last great flood. Being the most recent of the five major floods, it's the best documented. So we know, for example, that 15,000 cars were wrecked uh, during the night that the River Arno rose up and the filthy water and mud flooded many of the streets, particularly down, obviously, in the central area, the, the lowest part of the city. 6,000 shops were put out of business and nearly 14,000 families were made homeless. So that gives you an idea of the extent of the damage, as does this quotation which I'm going to read from Christopher Hibbert's book, Florence, the Biography of a City, in which he writes the following. Treasures in the refectory of Santa Croce had been blackened by the mud. On the right wall of the nave of the church, Donatello's Cavalcanti Annunciation was soaked with oil to the level of the Virgin's knees. Inside the Pazzi Chapel, the water had risen to about two-thirds of the height of the Pietra Serena arcading. The flood waters had, waters had submerged the cloisters of Santa Maria Novella and the Onisanti and cascaded down the Via Ghibellina, smashing the windows of the Casa Buonarroti. And then he goes on to write, Indeed, in the centre of the town, scarcely a monument or a church had survived unscathed. So, in addition to all that personal devastation and the problems for the city of Florence itself, there was, of course, also the massive problem of the terrible damage that had been done to the artworks. And it was notable that a whole army of people from all over the world, many young people, lots of students, arrived and offered their help in the rescue operation. So they formed human chains and hauled pictures out of muddy churches and packed precious works of art away in plastic bags and sent them off so that the restoration and clean-up operation could start. If you want a reminder of the flood in today's Florence, as you walk through the city centre, you'll often see little marble plaques on the walls with a red line on them. And that red line is showing what level the flood water reached it during the 1966 floods. So that's a brief rundown then of the history of the city, except perhaps to just mention 2017, when you may recall that um, one Theresa May chose Florence for one of her big Brexit speeches, thus reminding everybody that Florence still has a part to play as an important city in the European Union. OK, so moving on from history to themes wanted to just mention some of the things for which Florence is particularly well known, things that are going to keep being mentioned in the various podcasts that are coming. I think we can very much say to start off with that Florence is a city of churches, so many churches, of which the big three are the cathedral, so the Duomo, Santa Croce and Santa Maria Novella, uh, 
and each of those will have an episode devoted to them uh, further on in the series, as indeed will the Church of San Lorenzo, which was the home of the Medici family, their family church, if you like. There are plenty more large and wonderful churches that I won't be covering, so, for example, Santa Trinita um, and Onisanti. Also, of course, there are convents and monasteries. We'll definitely have an episode on San Marco, which is the monastery full of wonderful frescoes, mainly done by Fra Angelico. So, a city of churches, for sure. Another word that strikes me as soon as I start thinking about Florence and reading any history is the word rivalry. It does seem to have been a city in which factions arose and very much made each other's life difficult. So we've talked about the Guelphs and the Ghibellines already, um, and we've talked about the families and their towers. They had some spectacular fallings out because they were bus business rivals, um, one of which will be retold in the next episode about a murder in the cathedral, which was basically down to a business argument. So families that you might come across, we've talked about the Medici already, but you'll see a lot of other names. Um, if you look at a map and look at what some of the buildings are called or some of the roads, you'll find names like um, the Casa Buonarotti. It's obviously a house built by the Buonarotti family. Uh, Michelangelo's real name was Michelangelo di Buonarotti. Then there are palaces like the Palazzo Pitti, so the Pitti family. Uh, the Palazzo Strozzi, another big banking family. Um, one of the Medici palaces, in fact, is called the Palazzo Medici Riccardi. So obviously more than one family um, had input into that. Um, and so on and so on. These families intermarried, of course, because they often wanted their sons and daughters to marry someone equally well off and equally influential. But that notwithstanding, I think we can say that by and large, the family sagas in Florence were an example of rivalry. So the city of rivalry. Um, another aspect is trade, banking, prosperity. Florence has always been a well-off city. It started in medieval times, particularly with the cloth trade. There was much importing of cloth and dyes and processing it and exporting it again. Um, we've talked about the guilds who said, showed us what other kinds of work was going on. Banking and finance, of course, would be the other um, major industry um, involving the Medici family, involving the Pazzi family, involving quite a lot of the other well-known families. And something you may not know is that the florin, which of course became a trusted currency all over Europe, was in fact first minted in Florence. Florentines used it to move on from just swapping things um, and bargaining um, and had their own currency, which became very respected because of course the wealth of the Medici bank was behind it and so used eventually throughout Europe. The biggest industry in Florence today, of course, is tourism, but there are signs of some of the other industries which which grew from the early uh, cloth making. For example, the leather goods industry and the fashion industry. Um, the Gucci Museum is right there in central Florence. We could also refer to it, I think, as a city in which literature has been very important. It's the home of Dante, um, and it was the place where Petrarch and Boccaccio wrote their, much of their early work. It became a haunt for um, writers from other of other nationalities in, in later centuries. So, for example, um, Elizabeth Barrett Browning and her husband Robert Browning, they lived in the city together. They did much of their writing there. They wrote about the city in some cases. So we'll have a look at them in a future episode. And if you think about modern novels, um, there are quite a lot set in Florence, some of which I'll be featuring. So, for example, there's the biographical novel by Irving Stone, which is called The Agony and the Ecstasy, and which is a retelling of Michelangelo's life. Um, there's Dava Sabel's novel uh, Galileo's Daughter, which also biographical. It's based on 124 letters which Galileo's daughter, who was a nun, wrote to him, um, unfortunately, we don't have his replies, but the author has woven the letters plus some information about Galileo's trial all together into a novel that's very readable. Then there's E.M. Forster's novel, of course, that we've already mentioned, A Room with a View, and one that I'm very fond of, Sarah Denant's The Birth of Venus. She got the idea for that story when she was visiting the church of Santa Maria Novella. She looked at one particular fresco, 
She saw a girl in it who wasn't one of the main characters at all, but who caught her attention. And she weaved a whole novel around the idea of what might have been that girl's life. She made her a young girl whose parents married her off um, for their own convenience, really, to somebody who was turned out to be very unsuitable. And then the unravelling of the story tells you what this poor girl did with her situation. And while you're enjoying the plot and wondering how it's all going to pan out, you pick up a lot of information along the way about um, it's set in 15th century uh, Florence. So you get a lot of material about the cloth industry, about some of Savonarola's um, sermons and a real picture of what life in the city of that day was like. So definitely a literary city. But we mustn't forget science, because of course it was the birthplace of Galileo and the place where he did much of his work and where he's buried. Um, but it's not just uh, his influence that makes it a city of science. Not long after he died, one of the Medicis founded something called the Accademia de Cimento, the Experimental Academy, which was a forum really for scientists to come together to do their experiments, talk about them, tell each other about travels they'd been on and what they'd learnt, and which really encouraged science in the city. And today, of course, you can still visit the Galileo Museum, which uh, tells the story of science that was done in Florence. But perhaps most of all, above all these other connections, the one that really stands out that most people would think of first would be Florence as a city of the Renaissance and a city of art. It's the home of world famous works such as Michelangelo's David or Botticello's The Birth of Venus. It's the city which is the home to such lovely galleries as the Uffizi and the San Marco convent with all its frescoes. And once you start reading about the history of Florence, you realise that it was, the whole city really was, a, was an arty workshop for periods of time from the 1300s onwards when the big cathedrals were being built. Artists and craftsmen came to the city, met each other, collaborated. Masters took on apprentices. There are stories which I'll relate later of apprentices who actually went on to become far more famous than their quite famous masters. So we really have to think of it as a, as a community of where the lots was being created. Beautiful things being made and enjoyed and commented on and left for posterity. Florence is very much the home of the fresco. The frescoes are those wall paintings that you see. The artists um, discovered that if you painted your fresco onto wet plaster paint that was fresh, i.e. fresco, then it would last much longer. So that, of course, is what they started doing. And um, it's from Florence that we get that word. But not only is Florence the place where you can go and see in the galleries the most incredible paintings and sculptures, it's a place where art really runs through every street. If you go into the churches, the palaces, the cloisters, even some of the streets, you'll find amazing artwork just left still there, dating back centuries in some cases, and still there for us to enjoy. So I hope that's given you a reasonable insight into all the things that are coming in the subsequent episodes. And just to finish off this episode, I'd like to just run through the planning and tell you roughly what's coming in each episode. Um, so episodes two and three will centre on the cathedral. For episode two, we're going to stay inside, hear the murder in the cathedral story, find out how Brunelleschi's, do Brunelleschi's dome was designed and created, and some stories attached to that. And for episode three, we're going to stay in Cathedral Square, the Piazza del, del Duomo, but think about the other buildings that are there, the Baptistery, the bell tower known as the Campanile, and the museum, which has many of the originals of the works of art which were designed for the cathedral, and which have been replaced outside, in fact, by copies. And because the building of the cathedral was halted for decades um, by the arrival of the plague, I'm going to use that episode to talk a little bit more about the Black Death in Florence and read out some gory quotes from writers of the day telling you what it was like. Staying in medieval times then with episode four, we'll um, have a treatment of Dante, um, his who he was, something about what he wrote and something about the town in his day and some pointers as to where in modern Florence you can find remains of mementos about references to Dante. <laughs> 
Episodes 5 and 6 will take us to the two other major churches, so Santa Croce and Santa Maria Novella. With Santa Croce, we can look at the fact that it's really um, a mausoleum. Some of Italy's most famous people are buried there, so we'll have a list of some of them. Um, it's a good place to talk more about the floods because it was the area that was very badly affected by the flooding and to talk about the artist Cimabue because his crucifix, which uh, was very badly damaged in the 1966 flood, has been restored and is now there back on display in one of the chapels um, and stands really as a symbol of the recovery of the city from that terrible event. As for Santa Maria Novella, the stories there um, will revolve around some of the artists most connected with it, such as Giotto and Lippi. Then we're going to move on to the Medici period, um, with episode 7, thinking about the Palazzo Medici Riccardi, um, talking particularly about one very famous fresco that's inside, but also a chance to just run through the Medici a little bit and tell you a little potted history of the main characters. Um, episode 8 and 9 will revolve around San Lorenzo Church, so for episode 8 we'll go inside and also take an opportunity to talk about Cosimo di Medici in a bit more detail and his artist friend Donatello. The two of them are buried there side by side um, and they had an interesting friendship uh, about which I'd like to relate um, a few things. Chapter 9 then takes us outside San Lorenzo but still staying in the area. A description of what it was like in medieval times. Um, a look at the uh, Medici Capello, the chapel in which some of the later Medici are buried um, and the library um, sponsored by Lorenzo il Magnifico and some detail about what there is in there and, in, and some of the artwork that's in there as well. Episode 10 takes us out to the Piazza della Signoria so the second big square the square from which um, Florence was governed and that's a good time to tell the story of Savonarola, the mad monk who was burned there for heresy in 1498. But the story leading up to how that became uh, the case is interesting. So I would like to tell that there. And then episode 11 will go inside the Palazzo Vecchio. So that's the actual building in which the Signoria met. Um, and episode 12 will deal with Machiavelli. Machiavelli operated from the Palazzo Vecchio. So it'll be interesting, I hope, to hear about his life, read some of his writings and find out exactly what we mean when we say someone's Machiavellian and why his name led to that. Episode 13 will centre on the Palazzo Pitti, so the palace across the river into which uh, the first Duke Cosimo di Medici moved because he had um, his Spanish wife and ten children and the Palazzo Vecchio that they had been living in got too small. Plus, I think he was a bit fed up of living over the office, and so he had a big new palace um, renovated for him. Episode 14, slightly different, um, will be on Galileo and science in Florence. Uh, 15, 16 and 17 will all deal with things artistic. So for episode 15, we'll go to San Marco, the monastery, and talk about two artists seen there, Bartolomeo and Fra Angelico. And in episode 16, we'll focus on Michelangelo and talk about the two museums which have got his most famous works of art in them, namely the Bargello and the Accademia. And then for episode 17, finally to the Uffizi, um, where we'll talk about some of the works that are there and talk also about Botticelli. Episode 18, a slight change of um, flavour. We're going to look at the travel writing that's been done, or some of the travel writing that's been published over the years by people, many famous, some not so well known, who went to Florence over the centuries and wrote about it. And then the final episode will be to do with the literary connections in Florence. So a chance to hear some readings from Boccaccio and Petrarch to, and to think about the modern novels We'll probably miss out Dante and Machiavelli there, having dealt with their works in previous episodes, but we'll certainly look at the 20th century novels um, and I'll tell you a little bit about what they're about, read a few extracts and generally hopefully leave you with um, what you can learn about Florence by reading about it um, in more creative terms. And that'll be it. So just before I sign off, I wanted to finish with one last thing 
about Florence in general, which is a reference to the Stendhal syndrome. Stendhal, of course, was a French novelist, um, and he was the first person to suffer from this affliction, which is that he got so excited before he even got to Florence about all the wonderful artwork he was going to see that he became really quite overwhelmed and ill. And this was then found to happen to other people. And his name was given to the syndrome. When he actually got there, um, a writer of a book called Florence Art and Architecture, which I'll list in the reading list if you want to find it, um, had this to say on his information panel about Stendhal. Um, when Stendhal got to Florence, quote, he was similarly afflicted where the sight of artworks often transported him into a state of extreme agitation and even ecstasy. So I thought I'd just mention that as a health warning before we get into Florence proper. So just to say, if you feel at any point you're getting a little bit too overexcited and overwhelmed, I suggest you press pause and um, take a few deep breaths. And I want to end that section by just reading you the last couple of sentences from this panel in Florence Art and Architecture, which says the following. The victims are generally single, middle-aged people travelling on their own. No Italians have ever been affected. So there you go, it might be psychosomatic, so with a bit of caution you can avoid it, hopefully. OK, so that really is it for this episode. Um, I hope I've left you um, keen to hear the, the, the rest of the series, and I hope that you'll join me next week when, of course, it'll be Florence episode two, in which we're going to start, where else, but with the cathedral. Meanwhile, thank you very much for listening, and I'd like to sign out Italian style by just saying Arrivederci. <laughs>